NASCAR Rally is go. Hello and welcome to this week's Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. For this episode, we're stepping into the high-octane world of off-road motorcycling to meet this year's British FIM World Enduro Champion, Jane Daniels. Jane from Wigan also made headlines recently when she won the women's class in her first ever Dakar, an extreme endurance event. Just to give you an idea, the route for Dakar 2024 was 7,891 kilometers, taking Jane and her fellow competitors deep into Saudi Arabia, from verdant oases to towering dunes in the empty quarter. Jane has been crowned FIM Enduro World Champion four times and remains unbeaten for two years, competing in special tests against different terrains. She also helped Great Britain's women's team to their first triumph at the gruelling international six days of Enduro in France in 2022 and has become one of the sport's most decorated riders. Jane started racing at 12, did her first World Enduro season in 2012, aged 18, inspired as a youngster by her road racer dad, Andy. I've watched some spectacular footage and seen dramatic photos of her in action, so I can't wait to hear her story. Jane, you are our second extreme adventurer type of guest from Wigan in two weeks. Adventure Ollie France is from there too. I think there must be something in the water up there. What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, but Maybe something in the pies or the pastry. That's what we're well known for up in Wigan. <laughs> oh, is that pies and pastries? Wow, delicious. That sounds great. Fish and chips where I'm from in Grimsby. <laughs> it really is great to have you on the Convex Conversation. And for those of you who don't know, will you just explain to us what exactly Enduro is? Yeah, so Enduro is a mixture of sports, really. It's trials and motocross thrown in with some endurance. So in the traditional enduro, which is time card enduro, we have three special tests. We have extreme tests, which can be natural obstacles or man-made obstacles. So logs, rock gardens, or in quarries, natural terrain, that kind of thing. Then we have the motocross test, which is more about speed. So it can be in an open field or does often use parts of motocross tracks, but we don't follow the full track. They'll take us like on and off just to make the track longer, but also a bit more technical too. And then we have an enduro special test, which can be a mixture of the three, but tends to be over eight minutes long or perhaps longer, just depends on what grounds they have. But those three tests, we are then timed on them. And then our time combined works out the winner of who's gone the fastest over the varied enduro terrains. And what about the bikes, Jane? Are you on the same bike for each different kind of test? Yeah, so we will start the morning on the one bike and because it is enduro, it's a test of person and machine. So you've got to look after your bike as well as yourself. You can't go and swap out wheels, swap out engines or anything like that. You've got to get yourself and the bike over the finish line at the end. Gosh, so what happens if something goes wrong with the bike? Do you just have to work with it to make it work and do what you want it to do? Yeah, so over the years I've learned quite a lot of mechanical knowledge from my dad and things going wrong myself. So you carry a few tools in a bag with your drink because you're out for maybe six to eight hours a day on the enduro bike. So you've got to be prepared for everything. You carry in case you put a hole in the engine case in to plug it to stop the oil coming out. Levers, bits of tools. You've just got to be quick thinking really and usually carry quite a few zip ties make sure you can just make a little temporary fix here and there but touch wood have not had too many disasters on the important races have you got any not disaster but any dramatic incident where you really did have to pull it out of the bag when something went wrong over the years i would say i'm quite gentle on a bike and i do tend to look after the bike as well as myself But during Dakar, I did have a big crash where I twisted all of the steering column, everything that carried like my map and everything to tell me where I was going, which luckily it didn't snap off, but it was slightly bent. So it was harder to read. So there was not a lot I could do whatsoever. It was twisted and beyond repair. So I just had to try and tweak it as best as I could so that everything was still usable and I got to the end of the day. I gather you went about 200 kilometres in that state, so you did well to hang on to it for that long. Yeah, so it was a 48-hour stage where we was away from our mechanics for 48 hours. So we had to go from point A to point B, and I did it after about 150 kilometres on the first day. So then I had to continue for another 400 and 
I think it was 70 kilometers in the end with everything still slightly out of shape, but we got there, so it wasn't too bad. What goes through your mind, Jane, when something like that happens? Because there was a lot riding on you with this being your first Dakar. Do you just have to focus on getting to the next stage and not overthink it? Yeah, so the Dakar for me was not so much go there and do my absolute best, go all guns blazing and perhaps risk an injury. The team didn't put any pressure on us. They just wanted the riders and the bikes to cross the finish line to show the reliability of the bikes. So it was nice in that way that there was no pressure from the team. But being a very competitive person, (laughs) you obviously set yourself a standard. So I was conscious of where I was in the results, but also trying to be sensible. (laughs) Your entry into the first Dakar this year was described by commentators as a baptism of fire. What did they mean by that, Jane? How different is it to Enduro? Quite honestly, they aren't comparable in the size of the entry, the facilities that are there and the amount of worldwide coverage. It was eye-opening for me. So Yeah, I think they meant how much more coverage I got from that race compared to the previous years just doing enduro. Because even for me, it's quite hard to put into words how different they are just in the way that when you're in the paddock, they're so big, you almost need like a push bike to get around to see everything if you wanted to see everything. They have a huge catering tent that caters for the whole of the entry list, including the mechanics. Whereas at the World Enduros and stuff, you kind of do everything yourself outside of the race. So your own food, you know, you take your own accommodation, but everything was there at the Dakar. It was quite crazy. Tell me about the terrain, because this year's Dakar was in Saudi Arabia. And as I mentioned in the introduction, there were sand dunes and and oases. What's it like? Can you give us any sense of what it's like traveling for miles and miles and miles on end against this kind of backdrop? Yeah, it was a huge eye-opener for me. Like We're used to just sticking maybe in one or two towns, just passing over a few roads to get from one woodland to another, crossing a few farmer's fields, stuff like that with Enduro. But then at Dakar, it went from being in quite a quiet town to then the middle of nowhere. If you turned your engine off and just sat there, you wouldn't hear or see anyone for days other than the other competitors because you stayed like set off in a delayed order like maybe a minute or 30 seconds between you the terrain the scenery roads that are straight for 100 kilometers that you would never get over here because we just don't have the space but yeah just a straight road for 100 kilometers rock formations to the left maybe a dry lake to your right odd camel here and there maybe a donkey but yeah it's crazy i'd say to anybody if you ever got the chance to even just visit go and visit but if you got the chance to do the race 100% get it done. And what's it like racing through presumably a lot of sand? Yeah so I was actually surprised it was a little bit rockier than I thought. I thought it would just be two weeks of solid sand riding and dunes but there's a lot of mountain ranges in between the dunes which suits me because I like riding on rocks with enduro so it was it was my cup of tea basically so I really enjoyed like the rockier days and then as the time went on I did get more used to the sandy days but the dunes can be like a 300 meter descent into a dry lake and you would never see that over here or maybe like a 400 meter hill out of a dry lake that you've just crossed for maybe a kilometer It's crazy, the terrain over there and the varied terrain too, because you could have like your rocky day, then your sandy day, and then there'll be a day with rocks underneath the sand. So then it's just like a day full of dangers and you've just got to relax and get yourself through. I presume the way you described it, that you are at one with your bike, it's a test for you and your machine. But how physical is this sport? Because the bike looks very lean to me. I would imagine physically it's quite demanding on your body, isn't it, when you're riding up the dunes and doing these kinds of distances? Yeah, so from the enduro bike to the rally bike, there is a huge difference. For one, I race a 254 stroke in enduro, but then we all ride 450s in rally. And because of the length of the days in rally, we carry... 30 litres of fuel, whereas on the enduro bike, you might have eight. So there's huge differences in weight in the capacity of the engine. 
and then the way that you have the bike set up too. So for an enduro bike, I have it quite small and compact because there's a lot of tight twisting turns in the woodland or in the grass fields. We tend to have flat corners and with the flat corners on the grass, you want to be able to get right up the front and dig the front tire in. Whereas with the rally bike, because you can be on it for anything from 10 to 13 hours a day, you need like a happy medium where you can still attack when you need to, but you're comfortable when you're on the relaxed part of the stages. Because you do have a lot of, we call it liaison from like the start where the paddock is to the start of the special test. We could do anything from one hour to five hours riding, just maybe up a road on some lanes, on some gravel track. So there's a big difference in the way that you have them set up that the rally bike is a more a stood up relaxed position and you can like as daft as it sounds stretch your legs just kind of loosen your arms a little bit have a bit less tension on your back so you're not crouched over as much and because of the longer days you have like lowered foot pegs a taller seat so then it wouldn't make a massive difference to a small person but for a tall person like myself it's maybe like two inches that you don't have to stand up because you've got that taller seat and it's small things like that that make a huge difference over the 13 hour day. So do you have to be quite fit? Do you train before you go to these events? Yeah, hugely. Bike fitness is a massive thing. You can spend all your time in the gym, but the different positions and tweaks of your body that your bike throws you into, the best training I've found over the years is riding a bike. So last year and the year before, I rode every Wednesday and every weekend and if there was a race I would race the weekend rather than practice because when you're against the clock I find it's a lot more specific and beneficial training than if you just headed to the motocross track and did three 20 minute motos whereas if you're actually against the clock you're pushing and you have a slightly different mindset when you're racing where you switch off to dangers whereas when you're practicing you think oh I'm not going to do that because you know it's not worth it I don't want to get hurt whereas in a race you're like oh no I've got to jump that ditch it's three seconds faster (laughs) and mentally as well how do you prepare and is it tough on the mind particularly something like Dakar yeah so at Enduro we will walk the special stages beforehand two or three times and just depending on how technical or if the tracks are changing as people are walking them because people walk different lines or like tamp things in with the feet it's quite funny to see the difference from the Wednesday when you start walking to the Friday afternoon how different the special tests are from when you first walk them so we walk those and we memorize them corner for corner sit there with our hand signals going left right stick to the tapes and you have all like your funny ways of remembering things if you walked past a castle when you was walking it that would be like castle corner things like that <laughs> whereas with the Dakar you don't walk anything this year it was actually on a tablet rather than on the paper form so in the morning we put in like a four digit password and this uploaded our roadmap for the day and you can maybe look at the first three notes try and memorize them at the beginning of the special stage but then after that you're reading as you're riding and you're concentrating on what you're heading towards but you're concentrating on the road but to make sure that you're not going the wrong way and honestly mentally and physically Dakar is the hardest thing ever because you're concentrating so much on not going wrong whilst also concentrating so much on what's coming up by the end of the day your mind is a little bit frazzled you just can't (laughs) wait to close your eyes and just switch off for a little bit I can imagine why in training you see the dangers more than when you're competing because obviously your adrenaline for the competition kicks in. What were the the most dramatic aspects of Dakar, the things that you did on that bike that you look back and think, oh my goodness, I remember doing that. But at the time you probably just kind of did it because it was ahead of you. Yeah, def- definitely you do have this like little danger switch that goes off. So In Dakar, I would say the scariest things when you're like flat out in sixth gear and you're just thinking, I wonder when this straight's going to like end. And then you're kind of like glancing down, glancing up and you're like, oh, it doesn't end for another two kilometers. So you like try and wind it on a little bit more. And there is actually a speed limit within the special stage. So you're like looking down, making sure that you're not speeding, but then also you're not going to miss the turn because you've got to keep looking up, but look down and make sure you've not gone too far and yeah so there's that and then there was a couple of like blind crests that you kind of expect to nicely go down and then it's a drop and you're like oh so you just kind of lean back and hope for the best and just plop off the top of it and it can be anything from like 
a six foot to an eight foot drop and you just land in a bit of a I don't want to say like a sack of spuds but kind of like a sack of spuds and you just kind of accelerate out of it and think well that was close maybe I shouldn't go so fast over blind crests <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of speeds are you doing when you're going the fastest you're allowed to go so the cap in the special stage is at 160 k's so I think I didn't look down at the speedo too much because you do have um, a warning beeper. So if you are getting close, it starts to beep just so then you can feather the throttle without physically having to look down. But I think I was around 155 kilometers one day and I was like, wow, this is a little bit scary. (laughs) And when you land as a a sack of spuds, which really sort of gives us a great visual there, are you covered in sand and everything and and other races sometimes covered in mud? So this year Dakar was relatively dry compared to last year where they had to cancel a stage because the track washed away. But no, I think the biggest thing for me this year was the dust. The sand wasn't too bad if you was riding alone. You get a little bit down your neck and stuff and if you a rider passes you, they might give you a little sand blast every now and then. But you can ride 10 metres apart. You don't have to follow each other nose to tail, so it's not too bad. But yeah, with Enduro, you, you can be caked from head to toe in mud but Dakar this year was relatively dry I would say relatively dry dust and sand (laughs) dust and sand I hear there was a story as well behind how you ended up entering your first Dakar yeah I had a really good 2022 season at Enduro it was yeah a really good year for me I did all my preparation my training my racing and I got out what I put in so I was really pleased and then at the end of the year I got an interview in a magazine an Italian magazine and he's called Dario the guy that interviewed me and he just kind of like threw in the favorite this favorite that hopes and dreams would you ever consider Dakar personally me and my dad have financed pretty much all of my racing career along with the help of some really great companies too but Dakar is way out of our budget 100% so it's never something I've thought too much into because spending everything on enduro and knowing how much more Dakar is it's not something we could have ever afforded so I was like yeah I'd love to do it if I ever got the opportunity but off my own back it's just not possible so he printed this and then the guys at Fantic which is my manufacturer who I ride for they saw it and when I went in over Christmas to renegotiate my contract for 2023 a couple of the the bosses were there and they was like oh Dakar we saw the interview I was like yeah if uh, if the opportunity ever arises I wouldn't say no and they all like raised an eyebrow and they was like "Hmm, okay and then a couple of months later they was like yeah so we can do the world enduro championship if you like and then some rally at the end of the year and I was like oh okay yeah (laughs) so that's how Dakar came about in an interview of all things. What did your dad think when they said that? I told him and he was like, really? I was like, yeah. He was like, well, how much is it costing us? I was like, "Uh, well, I think they're going to cover most of the logistics and everything, so not too much. And he went, well, it's definitely one for the bucket list. I bet we never thought we'd be going there. And I was like, well, I've got to qualify first, but I don't think I'd say no if I got in. And he went, well, go for it then so did he come with you Jane yeah so the actual Dakar I left home just before New Year and I didn't get back until the 20th of January so I was away for over three weeks and the sheer amount of money that everything costs in Dakar is crazy so I think it would have been something like five thousand pounds for my dad to fly out and spend the whole two weeks obviously we don't have that kind of budget but you do get I think it's three days free for an accompanying person in either the team or like a VIP guest pass. So I had two guest passes for three days. So for the final three days, my dad and my boyfriend flew out to experience it and then obviously hopefully to see me finish, but they did get to, so that was good. We'll talk in a minute a bit more about your dad and your childhood and where this passion comes from, but how proud of you was he? I mean, I think your aim was just simply to finish, but not only that you finished, but you led the women's class. How did he feel? My dad is actually a man of very few words. He's always there to support me. I don't think he's ever missed an international race. He's missed a few British races here and there, but actual world races or anything abroad, he has never missed. So even though he doesn't say a lot, 
I know 100% he is behind me because he's always there. He will fly. He'd walk, I think, if he had to. He's driven to them. So, yeah, he came out and it was great to see him because I'd done three weeks of speaking broken English with my team because they're Italian and I'm not great at Italian. I try, but sometimes I'm just thinking so much about the racing. They're trying to teach me stuff and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. So I, I can do like your simple conversation, but it is very minimal. So to like have my dad come over and just have like a familiar face that I can talk normal with, it was great. It was so good to see him. Oh, I bet it was. And Matilda Tomanini, I hope I've got her name um, pronunciation right. Uh, she's the development manager of your Enduro team, Fantic. She said that it was a gamble for them when they offered you that opportunity, <laughs> but she was so proud of your debut. Fantic must have been over the moon too, were they? Yeah, the whole team that was away with us and everyone back at the factory, they were all absolutely over the moon when myself and Jeremy finished. For me and Jeremy to finish both in our first year at Dakar, it was great for us, obviously. First time there and we finished, but also for the team because they had two, they call them rookies when it's the first time, two rookies to enter, two to finish and also both finishing the top 50. It was really good for them. Fantastic. Let's go backwards in time a bit. You've been passionate about bikes since you were really little and started racing at 12. What's that backstory with you growing up and dad being a road racer, etc.? Yeah, so dad's always raced. He raced motocross when he was younger and then I think he may have done a bit of damage to his knees and his shoulders. So then he went for something a little less aggressive and went for like supermoto, really enjoyed supermoto, then went on to road racing. And then as me and my brother got older, we enjoyed watching because we make friends in the paddock and just all cycle around our BMXs all day and he doesn't see us from morning until night when we're hungry. So yeah, we've always been in and around the paddock. And then my brother's three years older than me and he said, oh, can I have a go? And dad was like, yeah, but you're not doing road racing. It's way too fast and way too dangerous. We'll do some off-roading. So he still had an off-road bike and did bits from time to time. So he's like, oh, well, go and do these enduros. So my brother started enduroing and it was great for me. I still went watching, made friends in the paddock, played all day. And then after a couple of years, I was like, do you think I could have a go? And he was like, yeah, if you want to. So then at 12, I started and just took each practice day as it came. And as I got better, then I started doing like the kids races. So then I did each kids race and then I get to the point where I was... I was a really tall 12 year old so I went on like a full sized bike at 12 just because my dad's six foot four and I'm six foot so I had really long legs and I was too big for every kid's bike so he's like well you may as well just have your brother's old bike so I got my brother's bike and I struggled with it at first I can't lie it was so much heavier than the one that I had and it was a lot taller so if I was ever on a hill and I tried to put my foot on the low side and fall off and then <laughs> learn the hard way to always try and fall on the high side. So yeah, I started in the winter of 2006 and I went straight into racing in mud and for me it was probably the best thing I could do because whenever it's a wet race I always go really well and I'm pretty sure that's because like that's where how I learned to ride was just in mud. So yeah, I just progressed through the classes and some days I'd race two races in a day because they had the ladies class combined with the kids race so even though I was out of the kids race because I was on an adult's bike I was still able to do the ladies class which was any bike so I'd do the ladies race in the morning and then I'd go in the clubman class in the afternoon so I'd be doing like two races on a Sunday come home and then just look on the internet the next morning where's the next race at and dad would just take us anywhere and everywhere and then that progressed through from clubman to expert level and then expert I decided doing like the British races instead of just the local cross-country races and then that progressed into one of my friends going out to do the first two world rounds which I didn't know were a thing she was like why have you never done them I didn't know there was a ladies class and she was like yeah it was great you should give it a go so then dad and I drove out to Italy in I think it was around July of 2012 and we did the third round of the women's championship and I had a really good first day I got third absolutely over the moon couldn't believe it but then I'd done the opposite of dehydrating and over hydrating and I diluted everything in my system so then I was just as ill as if I'd have dehydrated and I didn't end up starting on the Sunday because I was completely drained of energy and I think I was as white as a ghost for about a week after that. So it took me a little while to recover. 
What was it, Jane, that just captured your imagination about it and made you want to do more and more and be on the back of that bike? I think a lot of it was because every time you rode, it was different. So it was never the same track or the same layout. Even if you went back to the same venue, it would be a different track. So every time was a new challenge. There was new things to try and conquer, different hill climbs, different obstacles and stuff. It's never the same. So I think that's what really I enjoyed the most is that I was never doing the same thing twice. I was always learning new ways or if there was hard and easy options, as I got better, I could attempt the hard options. And you can always progress every weekend. Was it the challenge of it that really appealed? I think I read somewhere that you said the more difficult it is, the more driven and determined you become. Yeah, definitely. The level never stops. You can't just reach a level, be the best and stay there because there's the competitiveness of everyone just makes it grow and grow and grow. So all the time things are getting harder, the bikes are getting better so then they can do better things. And yeah, there's no limit to it. It just keeps going up and up and the level keeps rising. And you spent, I think, a decade doing World Enduro out of the back of a van, didn't you? (laughs) Yeah. So I did two years of racing for a team where they provided the bike and we called it like arrive and ride so the bike was there we just had to arrive and we could race and then for the next nine years my dad and myself pretty much did it from the van and have you got some really good memories of that oh yeah 100 percent. even daft ones too like getting a fine for drinking a coffee whilst driving who knew you couldn't (laughs) take a sip of coffee but no driving miles ridiculous hours sleeping on the passenger seat whilst dad drove and then him waking me up because he was tired so swapping over taking sometimes I'd fly and dad would drive out and then we'd swap and I'd drive back and he'd fly just however work arrangements were we'd work around one another and yeah it was good. Gosh you've so lived and breathed it can you describe perhaps one of the most exciting injury events you've taken part in? Definitely the most demanding both physically and mentally was the whole of Dakar I've never ridden a bike for 10 hours a day, but this was for 10 or 13 hours a day, just depending on the road book. So yeah, that was the biggest eye opener to me of how drained you can become. Because even though I've done extreme enduro, traditional enduro, cross country enduro, I've never done something so long or for so many days. So 10 to 13 hours a day for 14 days. And by the end of it, you're kind of in a rhythm where you just want to carry on, but then your body's like, no, come on, we need to rest. And they're like, yeah, but we've done two weeks. Why can't we just carry on? <laughs> you just get into this groove where you strangely enjoying it, even though you know you're mentally tired, but you're kind of like, yeah, but it's good. So let's do a little bit more. <laughs> it looks like a fantastic adventure. I was reading a bit about the background of it and that I was quite interested to learn the Dakar adventure began in 1977 when Thierry Sabine got lost on his motorbike in the Libyan desert during a rally. And apparently he returned to France still in thrall of the landscape and promising that he'd share this fascination with as many people as possible. I think that was how he started Dakar, which in the early days went from Paris, didn't it? Yeah. To Dakar. Yeah, so they used to start either very near Christmas or very near New Year. And if you YouTube, which we did before I went out, like the early days of Dakar, they're trying to ride down the streets in Paris and it's frozen and they're all crashing on black ice or even just (laughs) crashing in the snow. So the preparation and everything there they had to carry with them, they'd be like snowsuits to leave Paris, but then... I imagine they'd want something really good to sleep in. But then as they reached the desert and stuff, it must have been roasting. So what did they do with the snow gear when they got to the desert? Did they just keep carrying it? Who knows? It was, yeah, because they didn't have the support crews and the logistics like we do back then. So yeah, it's crazy how much it has evolved from its first edition to now. I think the founder said as well that it's about friendship and team spirit. Did you feel that when you were out there? Yeah, 100%. If you was stopped just readjusting something, it didn't matter if it was in the special stage or on the liaison stage. People would either slow down, give you the thumbs up and you was like, yeah, yeah, go, go. Everybody's looking out for everyone. It is really nice. Even though it's still a race, everyone still cares for everyone else because I think it's the amount of preparation and time that everybody puts in. If you can help them just 
get that little bit further, you do because you'd like to think that someone would do it for you further back. Absolutely. The founder also coined a motto saying a challenge for those who go, a dream for those who stay behind. I bet you're really chuffed you went, aren't you, Jane? Oh, 100%. It's like number one on the bucket list ticked. (laughs) We didn't see you lining up for your fifth world enduro title of the Enduro GP in Portugal, but that was for very good reason, wasn't it? It was indeed. Yeah, I won't be doing much extreme off-roading. I'm not going to rule it out completely because I am still riding my trials bike a little bit because I feel like that's a safe motorsporting option at the minute. But yeah, I'm not doing too much this year because I'm actually expecting my first child in the end of October. That's fantastic. Now the route for Dakar 2025 is taking place, but I'm guessing your baby presumably will be too young for you to take part, will he or she? Well, he or she will be around two months old. And even if the baby was happy for mum to disappear, I'm not sure my body will be prepared so soon after childbirth to take part in the most demanding off-road enduro race in the world. So maybe I'll reel 25 out, but I certainly won't rule out 2026. Do you think baby Daniels as well will have an interest? You know, like when you were kids, I think you said you always had little PW50s and all that kind of thing. Do you think that might be something that you do as a family as well? Because you've got so many happy memories from your childhood. And it just sounds so exciting when you described even just being in the paddock before you started racing, you know, being on your BMX bike. It's a very nice thing to do, isn't it, when you're little? Yeah, I would love for our child to get into something. It doesn't have to be motorsports. It can be any kind of sport just to be outside enjoying, whether it's competitive sports or even just mountain biking, something simple. If they enjoy it, I will go with them all the way. Yeah, it's fantastic to get out in nature. And I think it's something Ollie France, the explorer that we've just interviewed from Wigan, who's just gone from the lowest point in Death Valley to the summit of Denali. He talks a lot about nature and stuff. And a lot of your life is outside, isn't it? And and in extraordinary terrain and fantastic views and, and scenery. Is that something that you really appreciate as well, Jane, about the sport as well as the speed and the excitement and the challenge of managing the bike? Yeah, I think it's the unknown as well, not knowing what is going to be put ahead of you. That's quite exciting too. It is the naturalness of the race that's exciting because you think, oh, well, maybe we could be going up dunes today. We could be doing this today. There could be a forest thrown in today. It's just not knowing. It's so exciting. I think the not knowing is exciting. That It's like, oh, I wonder what it's going to be. Just take me back to Enduro just briefly, if you would, because Dakar has dominated our conversation because obviously it's perhaps the most extreme challenge you've ever done and was very recent. But when you do extreme Enduro, what does that involve? So extreme Enduro is different again. I did a little bit of it in 2012, mostly because my brother was doing it and I was going along to fill the van. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot more difficult. There's quite a bit of pushing involved, not just riding. And the level of extreme enduro now is crazy compared to 12 years ago when I gave it a little try. Like sheer cliff faces, rock faces unbelievable hills in forestry they really go all out to make it like the most technical terrain to ride ever and in some places riders end up helping other riders to get up just to get them through that section and on to the next one for the average person most of it would be unrideable and it would be worth teaming up with someone to help drag you both up a hill or through some rock gardens or something but then for the top riders I don't want to say they make it look hard because they always get through and they do it very well. But if it's looking difficult for them to do, for someone like me to get through would be near on impossible. (laughs) And then in 2022, you held the Great Britain women's team on the gruelling. It was six days of Enduro in France. What was that like? The ISDE in France, that's like our version of the Olympics. So every country sends in a team and it's usually a ladies team a trophy team which is men over 23 and then a junior team which is men under 23 and the six days is the traditional time card enduro with the special test but they miss out the extreme test so it's more cross country and enduro test related just because the level of riding not everybody could complete a extreme test and that goes 
over six days, the final day being a motocross test. So that's quite a short day. So the first five days can be really long, usually up to eight hours riding per day. And before the race, you have to walk maybe 12 special tests where it's usually three. So you definitely don't get to walk those three times over. You might get them once and then more trickier one you could walk twice. But yeah, that's another one that's like quite mentally tiring too because you've got to remember the special test beforehand and it's relentless in that it's very fast paced and at the end of each day you've then got to prepare your bike for the next day but you only have 15 minutes so you might change the tires change the oil change the air filter if you've bent something replace a part and then put it into pack firm and then repack your bags redo your hydration pack ready for the next day and working as a team must have been really nice as well yeah so it's the results combined for each one so you do try and help your teammates but after the first day you start going off in speed order rather than in team order so it's really good if you have three people of similar speed that they all stick together and they can help one another and it makes it easier for the support crews too because they can travel together so when in 2025 are we likely to see you back are there any titles that you'll be defending you know obviously once you've had your baby and started to recover and be in the mental state as well where you you want to start racing what event can we perhaps look forward to on the calendar or don't you know yet I don't want to rule anything out, but also I don't want to make any promises just yet because I've never done childbirth before. I don't know what it's going to be like. It could be a a walk in the park. It could be (laughs) traumatic. So it is at the minute just taking each day as it comes because I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to expect of myself, of my body, of the baby, how easy it's going to be, how challenging it's going to be. I'm just going to take a little bit of time to get used to it get into a routine and then see what we can fit in around that routine but I definitely love to come back full full time and do hopefully the same again I think it's going to be one of the most exciting challenges and satisfying that you'll (laughs) that you'll come across she says as a mum of two beautiful children your sport is full of risk but we end each podcast by asking um, what's the biggest risk that you've ever taken in life and I'm guessing for somebody like you Jane you're probably a bit spoilt for choice on that. So at the beginning of last year I got the opportunity to actually make racing my full-time job whereas beforehand I've always worked alongside my racing. So last February Fantic offered me the opportunity to take my dream job which is becoming a professional racer even though I'd raced at the professional level for 10 years I'd never actually made a living out of it so last February I took the plunge I handed in my notice at work and I was a professional racer for 12 months (laughs) that's fantastic yeah that's definitely my biggest achievement but also the biggest step I've ever taken in just having an income from racing a bike. It was crazy, but great all the same. I had the best world once ever. <laughs> well, hopefully that will um, happen again in the future. And Fantic and your colleagues that um, support you have been fantastic to deal with in organising our podcast because I really did find you just by seeking you out on, on social <laughs> media. Yeah. But they couldn't have been nicer. No, Fantic have been great throughout the last 12 months and also since I let them know about my pregnancy because they've actually swapped my role instead of being a professional athlete slash racer, I'm now their brand ambassador. So I'm continuing to work alongside them and still be heavily involved in a sport that I've been involved in for so long. Wow. Well, it has been fantastic hearing more about your sport. Before we started recording, I confess to you that I I don't know a lot about Enduro and a lot about Dakar, but it was great reading up on it all and then even better hearing your stories one-on-one. So thanks ever so much for joining me, Jane. And I really hope everything goes well with your pregnancy. And and then at some point, we'll see you taking that world champion title again. Yes, I really hope so too. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to British FIM World Enduro Champion Jane Daniels, who this year won the women's class in her first ever Dakar Endurance Challenge. Download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Apple or wherever you listen to yours. There are more than 180 episodes to choose from, including Ollie France, also from Wigan, who went out last week. Join me next week for another great conversation. Until then, bye for now.